Hi everyone, welcome to lecture three. So today we are gonna be talking about factor endowments and the heckscher olin model. So um, last week we learned that the, when there are differences in opportunity costs between countries, a concept that we called comparative advantage, there's a motivation for trade. So by specializing in trade and trading, countries can be made better off. In the Ricardian model, there was one source of comparative advantage and it was differences in technology. So this meant that the pattern of trade was going to be determined by differences in technology. Countries will export goods that they produce relatively efficiently and they'll import goods um, that they produce relatively inefficiently. Um, and also the entire gain from trade was just driven by differences in technology. We also looked at how to think about the gains from trade which is going to be in terms of consumption. So specializing in trading doesn't change anything about the productive capacities of the world or the countries involved, but it does change the consumption opportunities of the countries involved. However, there are a few limitations of the Ricardian model. The big one is that there is only one factor of production, uh, which was labor. The second is that when we were thinking about the distribution of income or in particular, um, you know, how are the gains from trade distrib distributed? Um, we weren't able to say whether or not trade produced winners and losers, or if some people gained more than others. So today we're gonna look at another model that's going to have more than one factor of production. This is going to do two things. One, it's going to introduce a different source of comparative advantage. So um, that is going to be uh, relative factor endowments. So a relative factor endowment um, uh, uh, or you know, differences in relative factor endowments, um, which are going to happen when countries have different proportions of factors of production, that's going to be another source of comparative advantage. And that means that even when countries have the same technology, there can still be gains from trade. The second thing that having more than one factor of production is going to do is allow us to study trade and inequality. So we'll actually be able to see not only the aggregate gain from trade, but the distribution of gain from trade. And in particular, we'll see that it's possible for some factors or the owners of some factors of production to be made better off by trade and the owners of some factors to actually lose from trade, to be made worse off. So um, first, what exactly are factors of production? Let's go through a few examples. Um, factors of production are any resources that are used in the production of goods and services. So last week we looked at labor. Labor was just the quantity of workers or the number of hours worked. Um, another very common example of a factor of production is capital. So capital is physical resources like buildings or equipment or machines, um, you know, things like infrastructure. So roads and broadband cables and all that, you know, all of the physical things that we use to make other things. Uh, land is also an important factor of production. So Obviously, for something like agriculture, um, that's that's very land intensive. Land is very important for that because you need fields. Um, but everything, you know, or most things at least require some physical space. So there's office buildings or restaurants or factories. You know, all of those things require land. And lastly, an increasingly important factor of production is skills. So, you know, when we talk about labor, generally we mean the quantity of labor, so the number of workers or hours worked. But the quality of labor is also very important. So know-how or technical knowledge means that you know, the same amount of labor could be um, you know, more productive overall, or it could be more productive in one sector versus another because of sector-specific knowledge. <clears throat> um, so in addition to the quantity of labor, you know, various um, know-how or technical knowledge is going to augment that. And another common term for this is uh, human capital. So you may have seen that. And the idea there is that, uh, you know, skills and knowledge are something that you can invest in. Um, it's costly to do so. So it's like investing in capital, but it's, um, it's something that like capital you use to produce other stuff. In the Ricardian model, the only factor of production we had was labor. Um, and now we're going to look at another model that introduces a second factor of production and see what happens. So the model we're going to study is called the Heckscher-Olin model. It's also called the two by two by two model sometimes. 
Uh, and it's called that because it's got two countries, two goods, and two factors of production. Uh, so in this model, unlike the Ricardian model, countries are going to have the exact same technology. Um, we're also going to make another assumption that consumers in each country have the same preference uh, over goods. Each sector is going to produce using both factors, um, but industries are going to differ in what's called their factor intensity. So we're going to have two factors. Um, in particular, we're going to have labor and capital. And one sector is going to be more labor intensive, which means it uses relatively more labor. And the other sector is going to be more capital intensive, which means it uses uh, relatively more capital. So just as an example of this, think about agriculture versus manufacturing. Um, agriculture is uh, very land intensive. So you do need land and capital uh, to do agriculture. You need um, you know, some land and you also need some machines, you know, tractors and things like that. But the land part of that is much more important. Manufacturing, you also need land and capital. You need physical space to put your, you know, your factories and your trucks and all that. But the capital part of it is much more important. So the machines, the equipment, um, all of those things are a much bigger part of the equation for manufacturing. So we would say that agriculture is land intensive and manufacturing is capital intensive. We're also going to have the same assumption of uh, perfect mobility between industries for both factors. So we're going to have labor and capital, and both of them can move freely between each sector. And we're going to have another assumption um, that technically is very important. Um, it's called constant returns to scale. Uh, returns to scale is a concept that we're going to spend a lot of time on next week when we talk about increasing returns to scale. Um, the hecht and model, uh, there's a constant returns to scale of assumption. Um, and I, so I just want to introduce that concept today. So um, first of all, let's take a closer look at um, factor intensity. Um, the two goods that we're going to be producing in this example are going to be fish and steel. The two factors that we're going to be using to produce these are labor and capital. Um, so fish and steel are both going to use labor and capital. Um, but firms in each of those sectors are going to decide the mix of each factor to use based on their prices. So um, the price of labor is going to be wages and the price of capital is going to be rent. And the idea there is that there's some capital owner somewhere else and they're actually renting the physical capital to the producers. So the way we're going to define factor intensity is we're going to take a given wage to rent ratio. So holding factor price is constant. We're going to see how much of each factor is used in each sector. And the sector that uses uh, more labor relative to capital at a given wage to rent ratio, we're going to say is labor intensive. And the sector that uses more capital relative to labor at that same wage to rent ratio is going to be uh, capital intensive. So we're going to just assume that fish is labor intensive. So that means that at a given wage and rent, this ratio of labor to capital, so labor used in the fish sector divided by capital used in the fish sector is going to be greater than the same uh, units of labor per capital in the steel sector. And if this is true, if fish is labor intensive, it must be the case that steel is capital intensive, since if you just flip this inequality, uh, we would see that uh, capital per worker in the, steer, in the steel sector is greater than capital per worker in the fish sector. So um, to be a little more technical about the production environment, um, I also want to introduce the concept of a production function, which you may or may not have seen before in your other classes. Um, we're going to use something called the Cobb-Douglas production function. The reason we're using this one is that it's actually very common in economics. Um, about half the time you see a production function anywhere, it's going to be Cobb-Douglas. And the reason is it's just very simple and it's very convenient. And we're actually going to use one of those very convenient reasons uh, today. Uh, so, um, so for the fish sector, um, this production function means that for the given amounts of inputs here on the right-hand side, so L is labor, K is capital, um, we're just going to plug them into this equation and it'll tell us how much output we get. So capital or production functions just tell us, you know, for a given amount of inputs, how much output do we get. So if we take a given amount of labor, uh, we take uh, L to the A, multiply it by capital to the B, 
uh, we plug that in and that gives us the quantity of fish. Uh, so these two exponents here, A and B, um, these aren't inputs, these are just fixed um, parameters of the production function and they're gonna determine the relative contributions of labor and capital. So remember that constant returns to scale assumption. So what that means is that if we double our inputs, so if we double our inputs on the right-hand side over here, we're going to exactly double our outputs. And with a Cobb-Douglas production function, we have constant returns to scale when A plus B equals one. So that's one of its convenient properties. Another one is that these two exponents are going to tell us the factor intensity of each sector without us having to do any more work. So in particular, if A is greater than B, then at the same level of capital, labor is going to be relatively more productive in the fish sector, which means that firms in the fish sector are gonna to wanna to use a greater ratio of labor to capital than in the steel sector. So that's gonna mean that fish is labor intensive and steel is capital intensive. And of course, we could see that the other way around if we're, if we're looking at the steel production function. If A is greater than B, then capital is going to be relatively more productive um, in the steel sector given the same amount of labor. And so, um, so that's very convenient. You know, remember the way we determine factor intensity is by you know, taking a given wage rent ratio and seeing what the optimal allocation of labor and capital is in each sector and comparing, well, we don't have to do that. We just have to look at these exponents when we have a Cobb-Douglas production function. Okay, so before getting to trade or before getting to equilibrium, let's take a look at what this domestic production environment actually looks like. Um, and we're gonna do that again by looking at the production possibility frontier, which as a reminder, just tells us all of the possible bundles of goods um, that we can produce given our resources. So you'll notice that this looks a little bit different than the production possibility frontier from the Ricardian model. And in particular, it's curved. So in the Ricardian model, we just had this straight line um, it was a linear PPF. Well, now we have what's called a concave PPF. So it's curved and it has this particular shape, which we call concave. And that has a really important implication. So remember that the slope of the PPF is going to tell us the opportunity cost of the good on the x-axis. So if we start up here, we're making all fish and we move along the PPF, we're giving up some fish and we're getting some steel. And we do that, it's at the rate of the opportunity cost. So up here, the PPF is, is pretty flat. So if we give up just a little bit of fish, we end up getting quite a lot of steel. Over here though, the PPF is a little bit steeper. So we give up a little bit more fish to get the same amount of steel. And over here, it's even steeper. So we give up more fish to get the same amount of steel and more fish still. So the PPF is continually getting steeper as we produce more steel, which means that the opportunity cost of steel is increasing. So as we produce more steel, the opportunity cost of steel rises. And this means that we're gonna have what's called diminishing returns to specialization. So as we produce more of a good, as we put more of our resources in that sector, we're specializing in it, but the cost of doing so is rising. And so, the reason the PPF looks like this is a little bit technical, but I'm gonna to try to give you some intuition for why it's like that. So we're gonna work through a simple little example here. Um, suppose that our resources are 10 labor and 10 capital, and we have the following production functions. So right away, we should be able to see that fish is the labor intensive sector and steel is the capital intensive sector. Why is that? Well, if we look at these exponents here, we see that in the fish sector, labor has an exponent of 0.8 and capital has an exponent, an exponent of 0.2. So since this exponent is bigger, that means that fish is going to be the um, labor intensive sector. Labor is going to be relatively more productive in the fish sector because it gets this larger exponent. And it'll be the opposite in the steel sector. Capital gets the larger exponent. So, cap, uh, so steel is going to be the capital intensive sector. So what we wanna do is just, um, plot out a couple of points on the PPF by, um, by allocating our resources across these things. So say we produce only fish, we put all of our 10 units of labor and all of our 10 units of capital into the fish sector. So we plug 10 and 10 into this production function here, 
and we see that 10 to the 0.8 times 10 to the 0.2 is exactly equal to 10 fish. So if we're producing only fish, we can get 10 fish. Do the same thing in the steel sector. We put all the resources into making steel, plug uh, 10 labor and 10 capital into the production function for steel here, and we'll see that we can get 10 steel. So the two endpoints of this production function uh, possibility, production possibility frontier here are going to be uh, 10 fish and 10 steel. But what's going to happen if we allocate our resources equally um, so we can get equal amounts of fish and steel? So remember that these two industries differ in their factor intensity. And if we're trying to produce equal amounts of fish and steel, we can do something um, kind of interesting from a production efficiency standpoint, which is that we can allocate our factors of production optimally across these sectors. So in particular, say we want equal amounts of fish and steel, what we can do is we can put eight units of labor and two units of capital in the fish sector and two units of labor and eight units of capital in the steel sector. So what we've done is we've taken our, our total resources and we've split them equally, but we've done it in sort of a biased way where we've done more labor and less capital in the labor intensive sector, more capital and less labor in the capital intensive sector. And, th and this happens to be the, you know, the most efficient way of allocating these resources. Um, but you know, the principle is just that you wanna put more labor in the labor intensive sector, and, you know, vice versa. If we do this, we'll see that we can get 6.06 .06 fish and 6.06 .06 steel. And if you add six plus six together, you can see that this is you know, 12 and a little bit, which is more than 10. So we can have 10 fish or 10 steel, so 10 of one thing, or if we want two things, if we wanna have equal amounts of fish and steel, we can have 12 total things. And so something really you know, cool and kind of magical has happened, which is that by producing with a more efficient mix of factors, we get more resources overall. And because at these endpoints over here, what we're doing is we're just putting all of our resources into one sector. We don't really have the option to use this efficient allocation of resources. So that's really the reason why specialization is costly. When we're in the middle here, we get to choose to allocate our resources optimally between sectors. And when we're, you know, exactly at some point in the middle, um, you know, we can have whatever the exactly optimal allocation is. Um, but when we're at the endpoints, we're not really making that choice. We're just, we're just throwing whatever resources we have um, into that sector. And so if you do that all around uh, at all these other points, you would plot out this nice curved shape. Um, and you know, altogether what it means is that specialization is costly. And the reason it's costly is because we have um, differing factor intensity. And that means that there's value to this, um, this allocation of resources optimally. Um, and so you know, here in the middle, you end up getting more resources overall. Okay, so that was all the technical stuff. Um, so now let's look at you know what should be a kind of a familiar procedure right now. We'll look at these two economies in um, autarky, and then we'll introduce trade and see what happens. Um, and, and actually, just you know, one more technical thing. Um, just remember that you know the slope of the PPF is uh, it's it's not constant. Um, you know, it's changing as we move along it. And also in equilibrium, we know that the slope of the PPF is going to be equal to the price. So remember in the Ricardian model, we just had one domestic autarky price. There was only one price that was possible in equilibrium. Uh, here, the domestic equilibrium price is going to depend on what exactly we're producing because the price has to be equal to the slope of the PPF and the slope of the PPF is changing. It depends you know, which bundle we're actually making. So um, let's go through, um, an actual example now. So we're gonna have, remember, two countries, two goods, two factors. So the two countries are going to be home and away. The two factors are gonna be labor and capital. Um, and remember that, that the key insight of the Heckscherlin model is that different relative endowments of resources or this, this idea of relative factor abundance is going to be a source of comparative advantage. So when we're setting this up, we want these two countries to have different relative factor endowments so we can see that. So in home, we are going to have 10 units of labor, six units of capital. And in a way, we're going to have 10 units of labor, but 18 units of capital. So these are different size countries. 
Away is going to have um, the same amount of labor, but they have more capital. So it's just larger overall. But importantly, Away has more capital per unit of labor than home. So if you divide K star by L star, would be 18 divided by 10, you see that the units of capital per unit of labor is 1.8. If we do the same thing that in home, we see that we only have 0.6 units of labor, uh, units of capital per labor. So away has more capital per unit of labor than home. And similarly, home has more labor per unit of capital. Um, so home has 1.67 labor per capital and away has 0.55. And so if we compare these two numbers, what they tell us is that away is relatively capital abundant. And by relatively capital abundant, we mean they have a greater ratio of capital to labor. And home is relatively labor abundant. And by that, we mean they have a greater ratio of labor to capital. So note, you know, remember in the Ricardian model, we had this difference between absolute advantage and uh, comparative advantage. Well, here we have to make, we have to be, uh, be careful about the same the distinction between um, absolute abundance and relative abundance. So if we were just looking at this chart and seeing like, oh, well, they have the same amounts of labor, we might be tempted to say, ah, nobody has a relative abundance of labor. They both have 10. Um, and, and what's true is that nobody has an absolute abundance of labor in the same total quantity, but the ratio is different. And it's this difference in the ratio of labor to capital that's going to um, produce the comparative advantage. And so it's the relative factor abundance that we really care about. Okay, so um, remember that the first thing we want to do is look at these two economies in autarky. Um, and in the autarky equilibrium, we really care about quantities and prices. So we want to plot out the PPF for each country um, and figure out what the domestic equilibrium price is going to be. So here we can't really be as numerically exact as we were in the Ricardian model, just because the math is a lot trickier. Um, so we're mostly going to do this graphically. Um, the one thing we can be exact about is figuring out the um, endpoints of the production possibility frontiers. So remember, we know our factor endowments. We know how much labor and capital is in each country. Um, over here, I've given the production functions. And so to get the endpoints, all we have to do is plug all of our resources into one sector and then the other sector. That'll tell us how much of each um, type of good we can have. So at home, they can have uh, 9.03 fish or 6.65 steel. And again, if they have something in between, we know that the PPF is gonna have this concave shape. It's gonna be bowed outwards like this. And in a way, um, they could have up to 11 fish or up to 14.6 steel. And then it's got the rest of the PPF has this concave shape. So um, one thing that we can see after we draw out these PPFs is that the production possibility frontier is going to be biased towards the sector that is intensive in the relatively abundant factor. So that was a lot of words, but let's break it down. Home is relatively labor abundant. Remember, they've got a greater labor to capital ratio. And fish is the labor intensive sector. So in home, the production possibility frontier is going to be biased towards the fish sector. You know, it has this nice round shape, but it's not totally symmetric. Um, it's, it's in fact gonna be a little bit taller because we can produce more fish than steel. And in a way, it's going to be the opposite because they are the uh, relatively capital abundant sector. So uh, their PPF is going to be biased towards steel. They can produce more steel than fish. So now remember one of the things that we assumed was that consumers in each country have the same preferences. Um, and so given that assumption, there's, there's something, you know, we can't figure out the exact prices unless we are really explicit about what those preferences are. But if consumers have the same preferences, it's always going to be true that home is the low cost producer of fish and away is the low cost producer of steel. So why is that? Remember, you know, fish is labor intensive, home is relatively labor abundant. And so, you know, just intuitively, home is going to be better at producing fish. They're going to have a lower cost of doing so and the opposite for a way. Um, technically what's going on here, so I've actually you know, plotted um, 
these preferences so we can see the equilibrium a little more clearly. So this is something called an indifference curve. If you've taken intermediate micro, you're probably familiar with this, but what the indifference curve tells us are bundles of goods that consumers value exactly the same. So, you know, this is a certain amount of fish and steel and consumers like this bundle exactly as much as they like this bundle over here. Um, and, you know, for moving along this indifference curve, what we're doing is giving up some fish and getting some steel and we're doing that at a certain rate. And it sounds kind of familiar, doesn't it? It sounds kind of like what happens when we move along the production possibility frontier. Um, and so remember when we're doing that, when we're moving along the PPF, we're, we're getting the opportunity cost and in equilibrium, the price has to be equal to the opportunity cost. So that's kind of like the supply side equilibrium. Well, the demand side equilibrium is, is something similar that the rate that you're moving along this indifference curve should also be equal to the price. And I won't get into that exactly because it's all demand theory stuff and that, that's not really what we're about here. Um, but what it means is that, you know, we have this indifference curve and um, its slope is going to be equal to the domestic price. We have this PPF, its slope is gonna be equal to the domestic price. And so when these two curves have the same slope, that's gonna tell us what the domestic price is. Um, and so these two curves are exactly the same. And, um, you know, the point where these two curves, uh, you know, this curve and the PPF um, intersect, um, you know, because of the different shapes of the PPF, that means that we're always going to have a, um, a steeper relative price of steel in home and a, a flatter uh, relative price of steel in a way. So home is always going to be the low cost producer of fish and the high cost producer of steel. And a way is always going to be the low cost producer of steel and the high cost producer of fish. So that's that's a little bit technical, but um, I, I think they have these, these pictures in the book, so I did want to explain that a little bit. Um, okay, so just in, in the autarky equilibrium, this is always going to be the case. There's going to be this difference in relative prices. And remember that the source of that difference in relative prices is because we have different relative factor abundance. And that's what's going to lead to this comparative advantage that once we trade, we can take advantage of and we can see um, specialization and trade in the game from that. So one more thing that we need to talk about uh, in the domestic equilibrium. So we have these two factors of production and factors of production have their own prices, right? We have wages for labor and we have rent for capital. So in other words, that's, um, that's the income of, the, of those factors. So workers have their labor, they sell it on the market, they get wages. Capital owners have their capital, they sell it on the market, they get rents. Um, the way wages and rents are set was kind of the same as before. Factors are gonna be paid their real output um, and factor prices are gonna be the same in each sector because we have this perfect factor mobility. So the wage is gonna be the marginal product of labor times the price of you know, whichever sector, so either the price of fish or the price of steel. Rent is gonna be the marginal product of capital times the price. Um, so again, solving for the exact wages and rents is, is a little bit difficult, but we can say a couple principles that are gonna um, uh, generally be true in this model. So in particular, the country that is labor abundant is going to have lower wages and the country that is capital, abund capital abundant is going to have lower rent. And that's, that's in autarky. So in autarky, we're going to have a low wage country and a high wage country and a low rent country and a high rent country. And we can summarize that by comparing this ratio. So the wage to rent ratio in home, because they're the labor abundant country is going to be less than the um, wage to rent ratio in a way, which is the capital abundant country. And there's a couple ways of thinking about this. Um, you know, technically it's, you know, one thing that's sort of happening is that in the labor abundant country, each sector is using relatively more labor. And so the marginal product of labor is lower. Um, and so if you think about the things that go into wages, it's, it's affecting this side, but, but that's not the only thing that's going on. So I think a more general way to think about this is um, in terms of factor supply and factor demand. So factor supply is actually very straightforward. Just think about it this, you know, very generally when a resource is in low supply, 
or in other words, it's relatively scarce, its price is going to be higher. Scarce things generally command higher prices. And so if labor is relatively scarce, wages are going to be high. But if labor is relatively abundant, wages are going to be low. And, and you know, the same for capital. And the other way to think about this is, is through factor demand. So um, remember, we had this difference in the output prices in each country. So in home, uh, fish has a low price and steel has a high price. And so if steel has a high price, remember that steel is capital intensive. That means that producers demand for steel is gonna be higher or demand for uh, capital is gonna be higher, right? Um, you wanna make more steel, steel requires relatively more capital. So um, that's gonna increase your demand for capital and that increases the price of capital. So, so this factor supply, factor demand is kind of a way into, of intuiting it, but the important thing to remember is that the labor abundant country will have low wages and high rents, capital abundant country will have um, high wages and low rents. Okay, so now let's look at the trade equilibrium. Uh, remember, the first thing that happens when we open up trade is the law of one price now holds. So we have price equalization. So we had these differences in relative prices in autarky. Um, fish was relatively expensive in a way, steel was relatively expensive in home. Uh, but when we open up trade, those prices have to come together. They have to meet somewhere in the middle. Uh, and so the new global price is gonna be somewhere between those. So um, we can see what's gonna happen in either country when we have this, um, this price equalization. So in home, the relative price of fish is going to rise. So we started out, um, we started out at this point, this was our autarky relative price, this line, and we were producing um, here where the price was equal to the opportunity cost. We open up trade and what happens? The price of fish goes up and the price of steel goes down. So now we're on this, um, this new global price line, which you can see is a little bit flatter. Uh, and you know that's because uh, price of fish went up and steel went down. And so what we want to do is, you know, the price of fish goes up, we want to produce more fish, the price of steel goes down, we want to produce less steel. So we're going to move along the production possibility frontier until the opportunity cost is again exactly equal to the new global relative price. And so what we've done there is we've increased our production of fish and we've decreased our production of steel. And the opposite happens in a way. So a way was the low cost producer of steel and autarky. Now, when we open up trade, the price of steel um, increases for them. And so, you know, they can produce steel at this relatively low cost. Um, and now they get a higher price for their output. So they want to do more of that. So they're going to increase production of steel, decrease production of fish, move along the production possibility for frontier until the price is again equal to the opportunity cost. And that's going to be our new trade equilibrium uh, production. So what's happened here is the trade by changing the relative prices has induced partial specialization. So remember in the Ricardian model, it was like, it, it was really like all or nothing, you know, unless we were, um, you know, as long as the price was somewhere that was in between those two prices, you had complete specialization. Um, in the hector model, it's not so. I mean, it's still the case that, you know, home is now producing more fish relative to steel and home is uh, relatively labor abundant, fish is labor intensive. So they're specializing in the direction of their factor abundance. But the specialization is, is partial, it's incomplete. We've only actually really moved a little bit along this PPF. And the reason again is, is remember that in this production environment, specialization is costly. Um, and so, you know, moving along this way, completely specializing, we would be giving up a lot of steel to do that. So we only move partially along the production possibility frontier. Um, but to summarize this, um, we have what's called the hector olin theorem, and this is gonna tell us about the pattern of trade in this multi-factor environment. So countries tend to export the good that is intensive in the factor that they are relatively abundant in. So home, relatively abundant in labor, 
Fish is labor intensive, which means that home will tend to export fish. Away is relatively capital abundant. Steel is capital intensive, and so they will tend to um, specialize in and export steel. And so to see that more explicitly, um, you know, what I've done here is these shaded areas uh, actually represent the gains from trade. So if we are trading, um, let's see, for home, this was our new production point. And now, you know, if, if we want stuff, we now have the option of moving along this global price line. So that's, that's actually what happens when we trade versus before we had to move along the PPF to get, you know, different amounts of stuff. Now we're producing here. Um, and say we wanted to go back to, you know, before in the autarky equilibrium, we were consuming at this point. So we had this quantity of fish and steel. So say we wanted to get back to that ratio of fish and steel. Well, what we would do is take some of the fish that we're producing and we'll trade it for steel and we'll move out here. And so you can see that this price line now extends out past the PPF. So once again, we have this region that's now possible to consume in trade that was not in autarky. So this shaded region represents our gain from trade. Um, and, and I haven't plotted the CPF exactly here because uh, you know the resource constraints get a little bit trickier here. Um, but you know there there is um, there's a region where uh, we can consume strictly more than the PPF by specializing in trading, and it's going to be the opposite in a, in a way. Um, so we are producing more steel here, but if we wanted to shift our consumption back, you know, more towards uh, you know this proportion of fish and steel we can export some steel and import some fish. And as we do that, we move along um, this global price line and we can see that we're out past the PPF. So this shaded region is the gain from trade. And then one interesting thing is that um, it, we can actually benefit in the other direction as well. Um, so that wasn't really uh, strictly possible. Um, in the Ricardian model, uh, in a lot of cases, um, you know, the benefit would really be like consuming more of one good. Um, but um, here, it, it is possible to actually go the other direction, and and you know, even if you're specializing in fish, you could still be importing more fish if you really wanted to. But because of the assumption we made about preferences, it's going to be the case that um, you're going to be exporting the good that you specialize in. Okay, so that tells us about um, the equilibrium pattern of trade, and it tells us the aggregate gain from trade. But um, remember that we also have factor prices, and the and the change in factor prices when we trade is actually going to tell us the distribution of the gains from trade between owners of these factors. And so, in particular, even though there are aggregate gains from trade, not everyone in the Heckscher Olin model is going to be made better off by trade. There are, in fact, winners and losers. So uh, let's think through this. So in home, what happened? The price of fish rose, and that means that firms want to make more fish. So if fish production goes up, demand for both factors in the fish sector is going to increase. Now in the fish sector, you want to use more labor and more capital than you were using before. But remember that fish is labor intensive. And so labor demand is going to rise more than capital demand. So even though um, we're producing more fish, there's sort of this, this net increase in labor demand in the fish sector. Um, in the steel sector, it's, it's the opposite. So we want to produce less steel now. Remember, we're reallocating our production from steel to fish. And so demand for labor and capital in the steel sector is going to fall. But since steel is capital intensive, capital demand is going to fall more than labor demand. And so altogether, that means that there's a net increase in labor demand and a net fall in capital demand. And so remember, if, if labor demand goes up, wages are generally going to go up. And if capital demand falls, um, rents are going to fall. So in home, the change in factor prices is going to be that wages rise and rents fall when we open trade. In a way, it's going to be the opposite. So a way is going to shift production towards steel since the price of steel rises. Due to the difference in factor intensity, we're going to see a net 
increase in demand for capital and a net decrease in demand for labor. So in a way, wages are going to fall and rents are going to rise. So to summarize this, home was the labor abundant country. And when we open up to trade, wages increase and rents fall. So in home, trade has been good for workers, but it has been bad for capital owners. In a way, it was the capital abundant country, opening up to trade led wages to fall and rents to rise. So in a way, trade was bad for workers, but it was good for capital owners. So to summarize this, the heckscher olin model predicts that owners of a country's abundant factor will gain from trade, but owners of the scarce factor will lose from trade. So um, if you are thinking about, um, for example, take the United States and China. So um, generally what people will you know, say is that um, the United States is relatively capital intensive and China is relatively labor intensive. And so if we increase trade between the United States and China, what we should expect to see is that in the United States, wages should fall and capital rents should rise. And that's because capital in autarky was relatively abundant and labor was relatively scarce. So when we open trade, um, we'll see uh, wages falling and rents rising. And in China, it will be the opposite. Opening up to trade with the United States would lead to rises in wages, but decreases in the rents for capital. And that's because in China, uh, there is relative labor abundance and relative capital scarcity. Um, more generally, um, so the heckscher olin model is about what happens when we open up to trade in, um, in particular, but more generally, we have something that's called the Stolper-Samuelson theorem. So this says that when the relative price of a good rises, the relative price of the factor it is intensive in also rises. So forget about trade. Say we're just thinking about the United States and say again that it's, um, uh, you know, we have labor and capital and there's a labor intensive sector and a capital intensive sector. Um, and we'll use the same one. So it's, it's fish and steel. So say for whatever reason, um, the price of fish rises, you know, people all of a sudden want to just eat more fish. Well, this is going to have the exact same effect as international trade on the factor prices of labor and capital. The relative price of fish rises, which means that um, wages are going to rise and the relative price of steel falls, which means that uh, rents are going to fall. And that was actually the opposite of the Chinese example, just to, just to clarify. Uh, so if we did a fall in the relative price of fish, that would be a fall in the labor intensive good. And so we would see decreases in wages and increases in rents. Um, so we've seen that there's winners and losers from trade within countries. We have this aggregate gain, um, but it's not distributed equally. And in particular, some people benefit, some people are actually made worse off. Um, but there's another way of interpreting this is, that's actually quite important. So remember that when we opened up trade, we had prices um, equalized. So the law of one price holds and outputs have the same price in each market. Well, it turns out that in the heckscher olin model, what drives changes in wages and rents is actually kind of similar. It's called factor price equalization. So in autarky, we had a high wage country and a low wage country and a high rent country and a low rent country. But when we open up to trade, what happens is that factor prices in each of those countries equalize. So there's just one global wage and it doesn't matter where that labor is, it ends up getting, or which sector it, it's in, it ends up getting paid that same wage. And there's one global rent and it doesn't matter which um, country or which sector it's in, any unit of capital just gets that rent. And this is kind of similar to our assumption, the result of our assumption of um, perfect factor mobility within countries. So remember that tells us that, you know, labor will receive the same wage in either sector because of this mobility assumption, same for capital. But remember factors aren't mobile across countries. They haven't moved at all. Um, and so the way to think about this is that, you know, remember in the Ricardian model, having trade was like sharing technology. 
you know, having trade is like having the option to move along the, the, um, the production possibility frontier of the other country. You know, it's like importing opportunity costs. In the Hector Olin model, we see that trade is like sharing resources. So in autarky, each country had relative abundance or scarcity of one factor, and those things differ. But when we trade, it's almost as if um, now there's just one global relative abundance or scarcity of each factor. And factor prices just reflect that global abundance or scarcity. So trade can be like sharing technology between countries, but it can also be like sharing resources. Okay, so that was it for today, um, but just to give you a little bit of a preview of what we're gonna look at next. Um, so we've seen a little bit of this, but um, uh, we're gonna be talking more about trade and inequality. So the hechscher olin model gives us sort of a particular view of this, it allows us to study the distribution of the gains from trade. The owners of, a back to, uh, of abundant factors are made better off by trade, but the owners of scarce factors are made worse off by trade. Um, and just remember that, you know, it, it must be the case that the gains for winners are larger than the losses for those that are made worse off. Why is this? Well, remember that when we were looking at um, the change in the consumption possibility frontier, we had a positive gain from trade in the uh, gain from trade in the aggregates. So that means that um, the gains to the winners must be larger than the losses to the losers, the losers because they add up to something that's positive. And what this suggests is something interesting that even though trade did, ha did have this impact on inequality, it had this unequal distribution of gains, it suggests that the winners could compensate the losers and all could be made better off. The winners could take some of their gains, compensate the losers to make them you know, back to where they started or maybe even a little bit better, but the winners would still have some gain left over. So that has some important policy implications and we'll talk about that. Um, we're also learning a little bit about um, you know, what the factors of production are that are most affected by trade today. So we're trying to apply a broader lens to this hector olin model to think about how it applies to the real world and how we should think about the gains from trade and the gains from trade losers. Um, and we're also gonna take a broader view than that. We're gonna ask, does the hector olin model accurately describe changes or inequality due to trade what does it get wrong and what is good about it? So thanks, and I will see you all in lecture four. Oh, that's not right.